Well, both the U.S. and Iran seem to appear as if they're on a war footing, like uh, tensions are starting to heat up. You know, you're starting to see uh, the mobilization, uh, at least in the case of the U.S., uh, of, uh, of troops. You're seeing uh, another 3,500 now, uh, you know, 3,500 being deployed to Iraq, supposedly. Of course, they'll be going to Kuwait first, and, and who knows if from Kuwait they'll ever make it into Iraq, uh, because they might not be welcome on the, by that time. And we now see in Iran a very symbolic uh, measure. Uh, they're apparently uh, raising the red flag of doom over uh, one of their very important and historic mosques. Uh, apparently, the uh, it's not actually called the red flag of doom, but there's this there's this red flag that has some you know has some writing on it. Apparently, it has something to do with the uh, uh, with Hussein, who is a very important figure in. Uh, um, Shia Islam. He was the grandson of Muhammad, and he was beheaded at some point, and then later they got revenge. And I guess they're trying to make some analogy here by raising the red flag um, to Soleimani's death and Iran getting vengeance on the United States. So a lot of people are interpreting this as, oh my gosh, Iran's just about to attack, and I'm sure that the uh, you know the media in the U.S. will be very happy to run with that line and to say, look, they're raising the red flag of doom. That means they're about to attack us. That's uh, um, that's kind of like uh, signaling the bonsai charge, uh, you know, for the Japs. But uh, I don't really think that's the case. The way that you see uh, you know, Iran, uh, Iran's government talking on TV, uh, they're talking about uh, much more subtle ways of retaliating. They're saying that, oh, well, you know, in time, it, it may take years, I think I heard one of them say it, either the president or Zarif, you know, the foreign minister, saying, you know, but we're going to get back at them. You know, don't worry. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we'll have our day. Uh, might not be right now, though, <laughs> because you know they don't want to try and attack the. I mean, because ob the obvious thing for them to do would be to tr launch some uh, ham-fisted uh, assault and send in a bunch, send in a bunch of tanks to try and attack the 4,000 American troops stationed in Iraq. And that's really kind of what we'd be watching for right now, is to see if they're going to attack those guys. Um, and I don't think they're going to do it. You know, they're not acting like it. And, um, I, I, Part of this, I think, is because you do have a, uh, a bit of a split in Iran between the civilian government and the mullahs. And perhaps, uh, you know, the, the mullah factions, uh, you know, all the clerics are feeling very hawkish. Um, and of course, because their guy, their military leader, Soleimani, was just killed. Um, but uh, from what I understand it is that Soleimani is uh, – his, his, uh, he was kind of outside the standard chain of command for the military. I don't think he, he – uh, he worked directly under the Ayatollah, so I don't think he was um, subject to the whims of the civilian government. So he had the ability to be you know, much more aggressive, uh, let's say, uh, than uh, perhaps the, uh, the president – uh, or the you know the the rest of the elected uh, folks uh, would have wanted him to be, and it seems pretty clear to me that the elected government of Iran uh, has uh, not really at any point been interested in getting involved in a war with uh, the United States or Israel or or Saudi Arabia or any of these countries, and so that's why we get a lot of mixed messages coming out of Iran because uh, you'll hear the elected civilian government. Um, on the one hand, may, you know, sounding very reasonable and, and things on TV and saying, you know, hey, we don't want to blow each other up. Uh, this is you know, we're, we're reasonable people here. We like being alive and living in our air-conditioned uh, houses and, and eating nice food and, uh, you know, not worrying, not worrying about uh, if I turn the tap on, is water going to come out or is sludge? And then at the same time, you have these guys going on TV who are also, you know, big, big wigs in Iran. Uh, talking about how, you know, uh, oh, we're going to blow up America and we're going to, you know, uh, turn Israel into a sheet of glass. And, well, I don't know if they actually use that term. That's more of an American thing, saying you're going to turn the country into a sheet of glass. And anyway, we actually have a similar dynamic in the United States because, you know, you have a lot of politicians, especially the ones that like to get, uh, th that like to get a lot of money from – uh, from uh, places like uh, APAC or the military industrial complex constantly playing up the, the oh we gotta invade Iran we gotta take out Iran we want a war with Iran um, uh, I think uh, one of the worst ones probably is this Michael McFall guy um, he's uh, a, a congressman from uh, is it Houston maybe 
somewhere in Texas. But there's a bunch of hawks who are really bad like that. And they're always talking about how we got to blow up Iran and all this. And then at the same time, you know, some more serious people like the folks actually in the military uh, know that that's not reasonable. And that, uh, no, we're not going to invade Iran and conquer the country. And, you know, it, it's not some tin pot like Libya or Iraq, which, by the way, the U.S. wasn't even able to – you know, reform those countries. They weren't even able to handle that situation. They sure as hell aren't going to be able to reform Iran and, and turn it into a model America. Although, while I do think that is the case, um, Iran is, you know, when you talk about the U.S. invading a country, overthrowing its government and imposing a new government and turning them into an ally, Iran is closer to, say, um, West Germany or Japan in that sense. So you could almost make the argument that Iran – it would be easier to sort of have the neoconservative model applied to Iran uh, than, say, a country like Iraq. But I don't have really – have time to, to parse that argument out right now. So uh, back to the uh, the assassinations that started out this this whole, you know, I guess, renewed tension uh, between the U.S. and Iran. Uh, the assassinations of uh, Mohandas and Soleimani, uh, they uh, were buried – I guess yesterday or today. Um, it's tough with the time difference. I know I'm never quite sure whether news happened the day before or the current day uh, when it comes to Iraq. But uh, their funeral procession uh, attracted a uh, uh, massive crowds. Uh, you could barely see the uh, the their their body uh, Soleimani's body in the picture that I saw was in the back of a truck, and um, it was completely surrounded by people on all sides, and they were just having to walk at the same speed as the truck. Cause there were people in front of the truck, they're next to the truck, behind the truck, and it was filled the entire street. Um, and so uh, uh, lots and lots of people came out uh, uh, in support of that, which is not surprising in Baghdad because Baghdad is a uh, – uh, now after the civil war that the U.S. fought, um, they're pretty much all Shiites uh, in Baghdad. It used to be more of a mixed city as capital cities tended to be you know, a mixture of people from around the country. Um, not, so case, not, not so much the case anymore in Baghdad. So you naturally have a lot of people who are very pro-Iran there. And are uh, very upset to see Soleimani uh, killed. You know, and despite all the uh, all the trouble that killing Soleimani has created and stirred up, and all all the people that it's enraged in the Middle East, uh, Trump still maintains that uh, he doesn't think that this was an act of aggression on America's part in any sense. He says, in fact, that uh, we killed Soleimani not to start a war, but to stop a war. Uh, and so what he's saying is, is that, oh, well, we had this great intelligence, and this intelligence told us that Soleimani was about to you know, launch some attacks that would, that would spark a war. And so we had to take him out so that those attacks couldn't be carried out. Um, and so one, let's, let's assume that that's true. Uh, killing Soleimani doesn't mean that the attacks aren't going to be carried out. The people who, you know, presumably these attacks that they're that they're alluding to were already well planned out, and that they could just carry them out without his order, you know, in in his death, and then they could start their war anyway if that was really the goal. Um, and then two, um, why the hell should we believe what you're saying about you know supposed intelligence that you have that you know get you got from the CIA or somebody else um, when uh, the CIA literally has lied to the the American people about everything, and that's their job. You know, I, I mean, what are they going to say? Are they going to say, oh, well, we have intelligence that uh, Soleimani had weapons of mass destruction, or we had intelligence that said Soleimani was about to go genocidal? You know, I mean, that's what they used on Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi and, and however many other people. So that's the so that's the second point. We have no reason to believe you folks. And the third point is. Why would Trump, of all people, trying to come out and convince us, oh, yeah, yeah, you got to trust the intelligence community. You see, they've got this great intelligence, and it told me that I had to kill this guy. And it's like, how big of a fool does, uh, does Trump think his voters are? Because Trump just went through you know, two years of telling uh, the voters that, hey, the intelligence community is out to get me. The deep state, they're bad people. They lie to us. Uh, they make up fake intelligence. They, had it, they made up fake intelligence that I was a Russian puppet. That all turned to be wrong. These people have no credibility. Now Trump is coming out and trying to use them as an authority. I mean, frankly, I'm, I'm, days like this, I'm very glad I didn't vote for him because uh, I just uh, – it's it would be so insulting uh, to have somebody uh, that you vote that you know that you voted for treat you that way and speak to you as if uh, you don't have two brain cells to rub together. So I guess before I wrap up, I should mention that there's going to be a uh, an emergency meeting of the Iraqi Parliament tomorrow to discuss. Uh, this whole this whole situation and the U.S. Uh, bombing uh, Soleimani at the Baghdad airport. 
uh, without any sort of approval from the Iraqi government. Um, that'll be very interesting to watch, and I will probably have to uh, go over all that and some other things that I couldn't get to today, tomorrow, hopefully after uh, this emergency meeting is already over and we know what they decide. Uh, you know, uh, the big thing I'm waiting for is, you know, are they going to kick out the U.S. troops? Uh, since that's what, you know, people have been talking about, and frankly, it seems appropriate at this point. So with that said, if you gained anything of value out of this video, I'd appreciate you clicking that like button and sharing this video. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe because I do upload every day, and I'd hate to have you miss one. So I'll see you folks back here tomorrow.